Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 138, purely for curiosity's sake. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my hardworking and diligent co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. And why, dear, are you hardworking and diligent this week? I don't know. <laughs> you had to go back to uh, the office. Was it because I had to make an appearance in because the Because your company held a gun to your head and forced you back into the office. Yeah. For a whopping two days. Yeah. Just for the record, I have been going to the office five days a week during this entire pandemic. I'm, so, I'm playing my violin for you. So there's this overwhelming sense of sympathy that I have for you for the two days that you have to go back into the office. But yet, when you came home today, you said I looked so much happier. You were indeed much happier working from home and, today. And much more relaxed than the past two days. That and it I'd... didn't require any alcohol at all to get you to that point. See? So Look at that. I will hmm. send a note to your boss and tell them for medical reasons you need to stay home and work from home. Uh-huh. And uh, I'll send my medical degree along with that too so sure. it reinforces it. Right. <clears throat> Absolutely. But that's not what we're talking that about today, is it? That is not what we're talking. We are, we've already talked about that over dinner. Yeah. Uh, so today in our Disney Detective, uh, Disney's inspiring black youth through Imagineering, plus Disney is in the community building business again, because that worked out so well for them before. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Andor gets a season two, and the Old Republic gets a new trailer. And for our entertainment news... We remember Ivan Reitman. And how do you show the young heads that the old heads have still got it? We'll talk about that and more. And as always, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week and a couple afterthoughts. Sure. Before we do that, though, I do want to bug, I mean, uh, invite you to uh, subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. Video versions of all the network's podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, iHeartRadio, anywhere you can get a uh, podcast these days. I would also invite you to write in, give us your feedback, give us your conventions you'd like us to plug at the end of the show. You can email us at commentsintothings.com. We're also on Twitter at Twitter dot com slash insights underscore things on facebook you can find us at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast podcast not podcast we don't (laughs) no we don't do that kind of podcast (laughs) uh we'll leave that to joe rogan um (laughs) on instagram you can find us at instagram.com slash insights into things or you can find links to all those and more on our official website at insightsintothings.com. Are we ready? Sure. Here we go. Go for Disney Detective. So our first article comes from people.com, and it is um, Lanny Smoot is not your average inventor. In fact, he helped create spectacles that Disney fans would instantly recognize. Speaking with people in honor of National Inventors Day and Black History Month, the 66-year-old Disney Research Fellow for Walt Disney Imagineering is revealing some of his favorite contributions to Disney parks over his 24-year tenure with the company. Among the projects he has tackled with colleagues are various effects 
used in the Haunted Mansion, obviously personal favorite of mine, uh, such as the Madame Leota floating crystal ball head in the seance room, Spaceship Earth's Power City at Project Tomorrow in Epcot, and many more. He said, one of my favorite inventions now, just because it's current, is the realistic lightsaber. Some guests might see it in the soon-to-be-opened Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel experience at Walt Disney World Resort in Florida. It is the most realistic lightsaber ever made and extends, retracts, is super bright, and exactly mirrors what you see in the movies. He said, I also designed and patented the effect that will allow people to fight using lightsabers in a training remote, just as Luke Skywalker does in the movie. It's a feat he accomplished thanks to years of experience and versatility. With over a hundred patents from the United States Patent and Trademark Office, 74 of which came from his work with Disney, he is considered a jack-of-all-trades, inventor, electrical engineer, scientist, researcher, and more. He may have never taken that path had it not been for his self-taught father, uh, who got his bell ringing in electrical engineering at a young age. He said, it changed my life, and it's one of my earliest memories. I was probably maybe five or six years old, and it never left me. That urge to create something, uh, new things, doing them myself, being able to see it purely for curiosity's sake. He came from a family that didn't have a lot of money, but his passion and talent led him to secure a full scholarship to Columbia University. He went to serve as an engineer for Bell Labs before starting at Disney in the late 90s. Along the way, he received recognition for his 40-plus year career. Most recently, he was named the Inventor of the Month at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. He also feature, he's also featured in the Breaking Barriers exhibit at the National Inventors Hall of Fame Museum in Alexandria, Virginia, among his many other achievements. He's worked on multiple technologies that aren't even in wide circulation yet. For example, the ability to take a three-dimensional imagery without 3D glasses and the electronic panning camera, which is an invention he patented while at Bell years ago, which puts users in control of the view that you see on television. He had said about the latter that it might have been a bit before its time as it required a lot of network bandwidth, which wasn't really quite there because fiber optic systems weren't as prevalent. Through trial and error, he learned that inventors need to be brave and resolute in their pursuits, and that includes knowing when to just let go. You have to be realistic as to whether it will bear fruit, whether it will grow to be a successful idea. Uh, he said, I have ideas all the time, and I just kind of need to filter myself of the things that, you know, I could possibly be doing, which would be the have the greatest chance of success. What's going to be changing the world? Are you making a seasoned judgment? Okay, I've seen this type of thing before. Does it appeal to a certain kind of audience? Are you able to service this uh, many people at a time? And what am I going to put a little bit more effort into? Disney Parks, which is honoring Black cast members throughout the month of February, kicked off Black History Month with a blog post about him and his legacy. We have Black heroes all over, and it's time to tell their stories, and to allow young kids in particular to see a future where they can contribute as people like them have. He had said when he won the Black Engineer of the Year Award back in 1987, our stories as, are not as told as they need to be. At least Black History Month gives us a chance to do some of that. Um, and he, you know, it's really kind of cool that they have put this out there because not a lot of people know, you know, you, you, you see the different uh, stories of, of different Imagineers uh, that have been with the company, but... Here's somebody that has all these different patents and, and things, but yet, 
you've never heard of him before, but he's been with the company, you know, for so long and just, you know, so many different things that that so many people already know about. So it's great that, you know, he's been featured and and they've been talking about him. This is the kind of thing that really uh, is the the gems that, mm-hmm. that Disney has to yeah, offer. Absolutely. Uh, it's people like this that are so intelligent, so mm-hmm. creative, and it's not because they get paid to do it. He goes on at one point in, in time to say, you know, I'm never tired of inventing and keeping up with new ideas. He mm-hmm. says, don't tell my bosses, but I'd do it even if I wasn't paid. Right. He And that's – he's what inspired the title of the show today because he does this purely out of curiosity's sake. Right. Absolutely. And, and you know, one of the other things he says is, you know, if you do something you love, you'll never work a day in exactly. your life. He's like, you know, I, I didn't make up the saying, but it's so true. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm totally down with that philosophy because I, I adhere to the same philosophy. Mm-hmm. I love the kind of work that I do. And this is the kind of person I would love to just sit down and mm-hmm. just have a conversation with. Mm-hmm. Just to to get into the mind of a genius like this, and to hear how he thinks, and some of the and ideas he has, and just his thought process of yeah, you know, do I do this or do I do this? Is this going to get a bigger wow factor, or is this is this you know? These are the kind of people that you want to surround yourself with mm-hmm. because yeah, you never want to be the smartest person in the room because you're never learning if you are. Mm-hmm. These are the people you want to have in the room there that you can ask a question to. Or just see how they attack a problem Mm -hmm. and see how their brain works and how they break the problem down. How they think outside the box. Yeah. Because you know they're totally always doing that. Yeah. So kudos to Disney for highlighting someone with Mm -hmm. this kind of talent. And, you know, God bless him for what he does and and Mm -hmm. for continuing to do what he does. And what was nice was not only did the Disney Parks blog run the story, but the story about him was featured in multiple news outlets. So that was kind of nice that it wasn't just a, ooh, you have to kind of look here to find it. It was kind of all out there, which was nice. That's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Disney's getting into building communities again. Let's talk about that. Yet again. So this comes from USA Today. So have you ever visited a Disney theme park resort with its beautifully manicured and clean scrubbed grounds, whimsical yet reassuring architecture, chirpy employees, and a general sense of cheery optimism and thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to just live here? Uh, So that is sort of the idea behind the Mouse House's latest venture, Disney-branded, master-planned home communities. Yesterday, the company announced Story Living by Disney, which will be part of the same division that oversees its theme parks, Disney Cruise Line, and other experiences. The first community, which will be known as Catino, Cochino? Cucino, I believe, um, will include about 1,900 housing units and will be located in Palm Springs City of Rancho Mirage, California. There is an incredible demand for all things Disney. Our Our fans continue to look for new ways to engage with us to keep Disney as part of their lives, said Josh DeMauro, uh, the chairman of Disney Parks, uh, as the And the branded communities, he added, you can be part of Disney all the time. As the storytelling, story living name, the communities will capitalize on the company's sense of storytelling and placemaking. Instead of telling Mickey Mouse tales, however, they will focus on the culture, history, experience, food, and other attributes of the places where they are built. Every single element of these communities will be seeped in a story. The residents, DeMauro had said, will be active participants in the story. Now, of course, pricing, financing, and other details have not been announced yet. But the development will include a variety of properties such as condominiums, single-family homes, and, of course, estates. Rental units are not anticipated to be part of the mix families with young children and people of all ages will be able to purchase properties some of the neighborhoods however will be designated for residents 55 and older a market in which disney seems especially interested baby boomers actually baby boomers are much older than 55 (laughs) 
So, so I think they kind of misspoke here. Uh, baby boomers are moving into retirement. No, baby boomers are already retired. <laughs> anyway, uh, they're going to be moving into retirement communities, uh, says Daryl F- uh, Fairweather, who is the chief economist for a Seattle-based real estate brokerage, Redfin. So why not have a Disney-branded retirement community? Sign me up. I'm ready. <laughs> Uh, Disney says that amenities will include live entertainment, wellness programming, and seminars. Plans call for a centerpiece lagoon with a beach that will be accessible to members of the community's private club. There will be a public component to the town as well, which will include a hotel, an entertainment, dining, and shopping district. Guests will be able to purchase a day pass to visit the beach. Despite bearing its name, Disney will not own the communities or be the developer of record, nor will it be building or selling the homes. It will be partnering with a third party to handle those functions. However, Disney's fabled Imagineers, the band of creatives who bring the park's audio animatronics to life, will have a hand in designing uh, the town along with future uh, communities. As the public face of the communities, Disney will manage the marketing and sale efforts. Once the communities are up and running, the cast members will handle the day-to-day operations, including customer service and entertainment production. Uh, It turns out that the legendary founder of the company owned a home and frequented the Coachella Valley region um, where the town will be located. Walt Disney treated the area like his creative oasis. Uh, We loved our residents to treat this as their own creative oasis and explore the next chapter of their lives. Inspired by the historical detail, um, the clubhouse will be kind of themed as a modern day creative studio with each of its spaces creating different art forms. So according to uh, Redfin's um, Fairweather, uh, it's likely that Disney will tightly control the communities. That would bring both pros and cons, obviously, to homeowners. There wouldn't be the rowdy bar down the street or obnoxious music playing from your neighbor, but it would come at the cost of your own personal freedom. That wouldn't sit well with everybody, but some Disney devotees who like the company's brand and value will welcome the careful curation of the community. Uh, This isn't the first time, obviously, that the Disney company has dabbled in real estate. Buyers have been snapping up popular DVC or Disney Vacation Club timeshare condos uh, since Disney started doing that in 1991. At the same time, Disney announced that it would be building Celebration, which was a planned residential community located next to its Florida resort. It welcomed its first family in 1996, but the company no longer manages it. Then, of course, you have residents of Golden Oaks, which is the luxury resort home community that Disney opened in 2011, where you can see fireworks nightly from the nearby Magic Kingdom. Walt Disney has granted has grand ambitions to develop a working city with uh, residents, which would have showcased the latest in technology. And that's actually what Epcot was supposed to be. But after his death in 1966, Disney's successors reinterpreted his vision as a theme park that exists today. So Disney was actually trying to build a a connected, integrated story based community. And while the uh, the story living the story living communities are not Epcot, they kind of share the same spirit. And this is what Disney would have wanted all over. So details about the town uh, when they're breaking ground um, hasn't been set yet. And they haven't. And they've also said that they're not accepting deposits as of right now. So another money grab from Disney here. (laughs) Um, I had read another article uh, that actually talked to residents of Celebration, which Disney's kind of abandoned at this point. They're not involved with it at all. No, no. And they said it started out as a as a very you know it was a modern community. It mm-hmm. was a very tight knit community, right? And then tourists ruined it because right. it became everyone. It was all they they had uh, kind of 
uh, equated it to living in a fishbowl mm-hmm. where tourists would Everybody come wanted in to and, come and yeah, say and yeah. see what your life looked like. And, and how are they going to change that for these new communities that Disney's doing? Right, right. And because, again, Disney's n- just going to start it and then there'll be another company. So it's really kind of right. it's, the same thing. doing the same thing over again. And I love the fact that they mentioned that they're going to have all these types of different housing there up to and including estates. And they specifically mentioned they're not going to have rental properties. So it's pretty clear what income segment Disney's right. catering to. Or here. they want you to buy. They don't want, you know, somebody that's just going to live there for a year. They want somebody that, that has a commitment. Right. Well, and... I look at it from the standpoint of Disney's looking for higher end mm-hmm. customers now. Absolutely. In everything else that they mm-hmm. do, this is just one more thing that they're doing mm-hmm. that with. We'll see how how successful this is. This is the first one they have planned. Uh, I don't know if this article talked about it, but the one that I was reading said that there were supposedly five uh, different had, locations. The, the intention is to have five locations. They didn't say where. I'm. Yes, if I had to guess, I would say they would probably, well, I don't know, maybe you would do something like, I was trying to think like different regional areas. Well, so you, you, you know they do one in Hawaii because they're they're trying to improve, increase their footprint in Hawaii with Alani and everything out I there. Yes, I don't know. I don't know who would up and move to Hawaii. That's you, Well, you you probably would get locals first. Right. Then you'd get people from the West Coast that would be moving out. I there. guess. But I, I'm trying to think of, you know, because obviously they're planning it with the lagoon, with the beach, whatever. But do you do something like a Colorado with a skiing aspect? I could totally see that. So, yeah. that, you know, something where it's not all... Yeah, you don't have the same restrictions you would with a theme park, for instance. Right. So geographically, you know, it's pretty wide Do you do something, open. you know, in... The Midwest or something, you could something, do something in ranchy Jersey, type. like in North Jersey, where the landfills are, and, <laughs> and that can cater to a different group. And <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, there probably wouldn't be anything. I could in, see them using some of the swamp land swamp down land. in Florida. Right, right. Uh, well, know. I'm trying to think of you know like different areas that are are near something. You know, one that it has a lot of land that they sure. can do this, but also where you know. The 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 re the the region and the weather well, and something and the other thing is they have to be into. careful where they go because of the level of control they want to exercise. True, there are some states that will not allow the level of of uh, homeowner association True. interference that Disney's going to be looking for. Right, right, because so. and that we know that that was a big thing for celebration. Yep. And I'm sure it still is part of the homeowner association, but was probably much stricter back yeah. in the day based off of, you know, what color your house could be and your decorations for the holidays and right. when you could have them up and when you took them down and, and things like that. Yeah, so, maybe we sold our DVC just in time. We can invest in this and get in the state now. <laughs> get in we the just... state. But see, this is one of those things, and this is where I think I would have a problem because you're mo- – and this is why I never wanted to go to, to Celebration because you're with other – Disney fanatics and you're competing with other Disney fanatics like ooh what collectibles do you have oh are you, you own- I think you are a little bit more See, so I don't I don't collect for the for the sake of right competing with any- to someone else no, I collect I get- for the enjoyment of it right but then it's you know oh let's go over to George's house and say, oh look what George has See, for but Star Wars I would Wars go to and- George's house and say oh that looks cool I want to do something like that in my house now so I would use it for inspiration mm. more than competition. But it becomes a competition because you want to have a bigger and better no, Death Star. I don't Star. want it bigger and better. I you just sure? I want to have it, a nicer arrangement than I have in, oh, in my house. Okay, all right. That's how it is. I don't compete with anybody. It's not a competition unless, unless I'm you're winning. winning. Right? You know, right. that's the rule. Yeah. So that that would be my only thing. It's you know you go and you move there. And it's, you know. I'm curious to see what the average annual income is for the people that are going to be living in this mm-hmm. community. And the, the other thing, too, is are they going to have a school? Are they going to, you know, because obviously we know Golden Oaks, you know, $2 million to just 
get in the door to just, to just walk through the gates <laughs> right doesn't have anything so your kid either you don't have kids or your well, kid goes if to you're private buying school a two million dollar house your kid's going to private school okay? right right whereas celebration i know has their own school they district. don't have their own government though or police no. force or anything like that right. so they're a special classification down there which right i suspect so I, they'll be the same right so here. i'm wondering what they're because they obviously want Everybody, they right. they want well, all age. Well, they want everybody above who a certain income. Can pay a certain income. Yes, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious where that cutoff's going yeah, to be. But yeah, it'll time, be... time will tell. I, yeah. I think th this is one of those situations where we've already talked about Disney for some reason going back and making the same mistakes they did 30, 40 years ago. And they're doing it again. And they're doing it again mm -hmm. with this one here. So yeah. I. Makes me wonder how long Chopic's going to last in that position. Yeah, because uh, he's not only is he digging up the the bodies that are buried in the backyard, he's propping them up on the porch and trying to make a, a show of it. He's making the audio animatronic. You know, where this is this is weekend at Bernie's <laughs> with Bob Chopic. <laughs> Bob's the new Bernie. Nice. So anyway, that's all we had for our Disney detective this week. We'll be right back with our tales from the edge of the galaxy. <laughs> For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Quick on that transition there. You were just so excited. That's right, because it's Andor. Star Wars Andor Season 2 is a go on Disney+. Plus. The Book of Boba Fett is currently receiving all the galaxy's attention, and rightfully so. After a slow start, the series has turned into a jaw-dropping ensemble piece that we like to refer to as the Book of Everyone But Boba giving Din Djarin, Grogu, Luke Skywalker, and Ahsoka Tano significant screen time while kind of disrespecting Boba in the second half of the season. The latest episodes also saw the live-action debut of bounty hunter Cad Bane upping the stakes for a thrilling season finale. No spoilers, though. No. Except for Cad Bane. That was a spoiler. When the dust settles on Tatooine, fans will return to the familiar desert in May for the debut of the highly anticipated Obi-Wan Kenobi series. The project, which was in various stages of development for nearly a decade, will finally see the return of Ewan McGregor as the Jedi Master with Hayden Christensen also stepping into the boots of Darth Vader once more. And a breaking news that we just discovered do, 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 before do, do, going do, 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 on the do, do, show do. today is that uh, John Williams will be stepping in for the soundtrack for Obi-Wan. So we're all looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Given the excitement of such big shows, one of Lucasfilm's other 2022 releases has largely flown under the radar. Andor was announced at the tail end of 2018. And following development and production delays, is finally slated to drop during Q Q4 of this year. The spy thriller boasts an impressive cast of, uh, and offers serious potential for a compelling story, something that will evidently continue in the near future. In a recent interview, actor Stellan Skarsgård confirmed that Andor will be receiving a second season. The actor told a Swedish publication that after a brief break... He'll be returning to a few sets, including Andor, come this fall. He says we start with Dune 2 in July, and then in the autumn, it's time for the second season of the Star Wars series Andor. Due to COVID-19 surge, Andor experienced delays that extended its production. 
Skarsgård himself isn't sure when the first season will begin streaming, but suggested the date will be selected with Season 2's release in mind. He says, I don't know when they'll be starting broadcasting. It'll, be, it'll take some time so that, uh, so that it does not take too long between Season 1 and Season 2, which is a relief for us. Right, right. While the second season of Andor was something of a foregone conclusion, it's satisfying to hear the words from a member of the project's team. There have been rumors suggesting that the Rogue One spinoff would have as many as three seasons, but Skarsgård's words are the first indicator that things will be continuing in an official capacity. Andor's first season underwent a significantly lengthy production, in large part due to the pandemic, but also because it was shot on location. Unlike the projects in the Mandoverse, Andor did not make use of the volume, with the creative heads instead opting to build practical sets. The choice will allow the series to follow the look and feel of Rogue One in a seamless manner, but it did come with a drawback of extending the film's process. Because of the complications of COVID-19 introduced to Andor, it's difficult to predict how long production will take for Season 2. Given Skarsgård's words, there's a chance that all work could be completed in time for a quarter four release in 2023, but that seems to be a pipe dream. The production team does have the benefit of pre-existing props and sets on hand, which should reduce the pre-production time significantly. Should creative leads opt to use the volume for some sequences, shooting will go quicker than expected as well. It's been confirmed that Andor Season 1 will be 12 episodes, making it safe to guess that the sophomore run should be the same. Previous rumors claimed the first season would be split in two, but Skarsgård's comments thoroughly debunk such a notion. With the series taking on a new genre in the galaxy far, far away, Andor has the chance to tell a fresh story over the span of several seasons that will show the darker elements of the Rebellion. So what do you think? Well, it's, I don't know how many seasons, you know, it, it's promising that they think it's going to go beyond, you know, two seasons. But like we've said, we know how the story ends eventually. Right. So it's not like you can say, oh, we can kind of rewrite history. You can't. Rogue One everybody dies. Right, right. <laughs> so you you know, so it'll be interesting to see because I don't think they really have have mentioned yet where the time frame comes. Is it 10 years before Rogue One? Is it 5 years I'm before Rogue One? I'm guessing it's sometime before Rogue One. <laughs> Thanks, Captain Obvious. <laughs> wow, that was so refreshing. Yeah, that that's the whole thing. You know, obviously, it's not going to be when Andor's a teenager. He's, exactly. You know, so is it something where it's like five years? All right. Maybe it turns do... out that Andor has a twin brother somewhere who looks just like him. There you go. But that that's the thing is, you know, like, obviously, you figure, what, seven or eight episodes per season. That could all take place within a day right you know just you know they could pull a, a whole 24 and that's the thing we know nothing about the plot nothing about the story because his appearance in rogue one didn't demand any more story to the character so what are you trying to establish with this character right or maybe it's just the fact of this is everything that kind of led up to the uprising and the resistance and I could see you going that route you and know. kind of trying to fill in some of the blanks. But again, you, you don't need that. Well, and maybe it wasn't even the fact that they needed it to be about him. It was just, Hey, we kind of introduced him, but here's, you know, a whole backstory of, of what was going on in the time frame before princess Leia I, I showed guess, up in know, a new hope. It's kind of the but, philosophy that it's a big universe and it's not just about Skywalker. There's other characters. Right. There. But, the, get that. but the thing is, and, and, and that's co constantly something you're always saying. Why does, you know, why does Luke have to show up? Why does it have to be a Skywalker? I'll tell you, da, da, if da, da, that's da. the philosophy they're going with, then they damn well better not show up on Tatooine at any point in this series. Okay. 
Because if they do, they throw that whole idea out the window. Right. But that's the whole thing. You know, this is, bef- you know, like obviously we know Luke and Leia are, are kids. Maybe they show us when the V-Wings come into play and why we never see them after Rogue One. Maybe that's what they'll show us. Maybe. Because that was one of the big questions people had, too. Okay. Sure. We'll so. go with that. I don't know. We'll see. It's not like I'm not going to watch it, right? So we're we're definitely going to watch it, right? It's Star so Wars. Hopefully, it's a compelling story, right? And this is this is a chance where you have to have a compelling story, right? Because so if, if you look at B- Book of Boba, right? Fett, I was okay. just going to say. So you take the Book of Boba Fett and you take a character that had very little history in the movies, but his limited appearance in the movies made him a cult favorite, mm-hmm. and then you give him his own show. And it sucks. Like, literally, the first four episodes were terrible. The best episode of the entire season didn't even have him in it. Mm. That's a problem. Yeah. So if you're going to do the same thing with with Andor, you damn well better have some good story behind it. It mm-hmm. better not be four, you know, episodes of, of flashbacks and snore fests. <laughs> so that's just what I have to say. Okay. Anyway, also this week, we are talking about EA and Bioware releasing the Old Republic Legacy of the Sith and unveiling a new CGI trailer for it. EA and Bioware have released a brand new CGI trailer for the much-anticipated expansion to the Old Republic that puts back the focus on Darth Malgus called Legacy of the Sith, which finally launched after delays on February 15th. These high-quality cinematic CGI trailers have captivated Star Wars fans ever since the game was first launched. They quickly became a tradition for EA and Bioware's long-lived massively multiplayer online role-playing game as they convinced plenty of players to check out the game over the years. The Old Republic is currently celebrating its 11th year of release, and there are no signs that 2022 will be the last with new content. The game recently celebrated its 10-year in style, re-releasing the older cinematic trailers in stunning 4K. Legacy of the Sith is the eighth major expansion to the Old Republic, and the latest since 2019's Onslaught. The jump in, uh, you can jump in for free with some limitations by downloading the game on the web's, game's website at swotor, S-W-T-O-R dot com, or through Steam. The premium monthly subscription unlocks full access forever, even if you unsubscribe to all expansion packs released so far. So it's not a bad idea to pony up for at least a month of premium if you plan to explore all the story content the game has to offer, which is a lot. 2022 is cooking up to be a massive year in Star Wars gaming. EA recently announced that Respawn is developing three new games, including the sequel to Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, that could arrive as early as this fall. We already talked about on this podcast, Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga is finally being released on April 5th, and Zynga's Star Wars Hunters is opening its combat arenas soon as well. What are your thoughts? I don't play the game, so... (laughs) I have no thoughts. It's I become a Star Wars widow again. So the article you dissed me, you know, the other day just to once, to once plug. already on the on the day it came out. Just saying. So the article itself <laughs> dealt primarily with the um, the trailer that came out, which was again, it's fantastic. Uh, and I've I've always said that if you watch all of these, there's there was I think four of the original and uh, three or four more have come out. I would go to the theater to watch a full mm-hmm. length movie in the style that they do this in. And you've said that over the years. It is some of the best scenes I've seen, some of the best artwork, some of the best combat. It's some of the most thrilling Star Wars cinematics I've ever seen in any Star Wars movie. Mm-hmm. I really wish they would do an entire movie like this. It would be fantastic. However, I didn't want to just plug the trailer. I did want to plug the fact that the game is in its 10th season, uh, 10th anniversary. It's in its 11th season. Uh, one of the commercials that we cut to early in the show uh, happens to be for my guild that mm-hmm. is that is in the uh, game itself. 
We are in our ninth uh, season, ninth year together. Uh, July will be our 10th anniversary. Wow. Uh, so it is definitely something that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, primarily because it's Star Wars. You know, I don't really play any other online games at this point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also because of the community. We have a very tight-knit community. Not just my guild, but we work with other guilds and other people in game. Uh, and it's it's a great support group that, you know, it's a great escape from reality. Mm -hmm. um, it's not expensive to subscribe. And like they say, you all you need to do is subscribe once. You get a premium status and you get to keep all that content moving forward. So... I wanted to plug the game, the anniversary, and uh, the new content. Cool. So that's it for uh, Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. We'll mm -hmm. be back in a minute with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So some sad news. So Ivan Reitman, the influential filmmaker and producer behind many of the most beloved comedies of the late 20th century from Animal House to Ghostbusters, has passed away at 75. He died peacefully in his sleep on Saturday night in his home in California. Uh, his family told the Associated Press. They had said, our family is grieving the unexpected loss of a husband, father, and grandfather who taught us to always seek the magic in life. We take comfort that his work as a filmmaker brought laughter and happiness to countless others around the world. Uh, while we mourn privately, we hope those who knew him throughout his films will remember him always. Known for his comedies that caught the spirit of their time, his big break came with the college fraternity send-up National Lampoon's Animal House, which he produced. He directed Bill Murray in his first starring role in the summer camp flick Meatballs, and then again in 1981's Stripes, but his most significant success came in 1984's Ghostbusters. Not only did the irreverent supernatural comedy starring Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, Ernie Hudson, Sigourney Weaver, and Rick Moranis gross nearly $300 million worldwide. It earned two Oscar nominations, spawned a uh, franchise that included spinoffs, television, uh, television shows, and a new movie, Ghostbusters Afterlife, that opened this past year, which was directed by his son, Jason. Among other notable films that he directed were Twins, Kindergarten Cop, Dave, Jr., and 1998's Six Days, Seven Nights. He also produced Beethoven, Old School, and Eurotrip, and many others, including his Oscar-nominated film Up in the Air. He was actually born in Czechoslovakia in 1946, where his father owned the country's biggest uh, vinegar factory. His mother had survived Auschwitz, and his father was in the resistance. When the communists began imprisoning capitalists after the war, the Reitmans decided to escape when he was only four years old. They traveled in the nailed-down hold of a barge headed for Vienna. He said, I remembered flashes of scenes. Later, they told me how they gave me a couple of sleeping pills so I wouldn't make any noise. I was so knocked out that I slept with my eyes open and my parents were afraid that I was dead. 
They rejoined relatives in Toronto, where Ivan displayed his showbiz inclinations, starting a puppet theater, entertaining at summer camps, playing coffee houses with a folk music group. He studied music and drama at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, and began making short films. With friends and $12,000, he made a nine-day film, Cannibal Girls, which American International agreed to release. He produced it on a $500 budget-a-week TV revenue, Greed with Dan Aykroyd and became associated with the Lampoon Group in its off-Broadway review that featured John Belushi, Gilda Radner, and Murray. And that obviously led to Animal House. Uh, he seized the moment after Animal House's massive success and raised money to direct Meatballs, which would be a tamer uh, than a hard R-rated Animal House. He handpicked Murray to star, which would prove to be a significant break for the comedian, but Ramis later said that Reitman didn't know if Murray would actually show up until the first day of shoot. But it was the beginning of a fruitful and long-running partnership that would produce the war comedy Stripes, which Reitman said he thought of on his way to the Meatballs premiere and then Ghostbusters. He also put Arnold Schwarzenegger in his for first major comedy opposite Danny DeVito and Twins. By the 1990s, Kindergarten Cop came around and he had established himself as the most successful comedy director in history. Though not even being the father of three, could have prepared him for the task of directing 30 children between the <laughs> ages of four and seven in the comedy. Then we had the political comedy Dave starting uh, Kevin Klein as an ordinary man who has uh, who has to double for the U.S. Pr uh, president provided a bit of a departure for him. Roger Ebert wrote at the time that the movie is more proof that it isn't what you do. It's how you do it. He, uh, under the direction and Gary Ross's screenplay, uses intelligence and heartwarming sentiment to make Dave into a wonderful, lighthearted entertainment. He kind of stepped away from directing, but he continued to produce with his production company. And then with Ghostbusters Afterlife, he even found himself on the press circuit with his son, providing emotional support. Uh, emotional moments for both with the passing of the baton. Jason, his son, who was only seven when the original came out, included some nods to his father's film, like Beethoven and Cannibal Girls, in, uh, in Afterlife. Directing Ghostbusters Afterlife was completely intimidating, Jason had said last year. I was lucky enough to do it sitting next to my dad. He always took comedy and the power of laughter seriously. The great cliche is about how damn tough comedy is, but of course nobody really gives that any respect, he had told the Lo Los Angeles Times in 2000. It's such a visceral thing, laughing. Some get to the point where we can get an audience of 600 people laughing is really precise and intricate work. My sense is we're laughing at the same time. We've always uh, laughing at the same things that we've always laughed at, but the language of the filmmaker and the performer shifts. Yeah. I mean, it's a tremendous loss. He's, he's incredibly talented with what he's produced. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know that the article brought out was some of the stuff about his personal life, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, what his, his mother and father is, went through. Right. And the fact that he had to basically steal away in a in a, a I don't know a coffin almost right you right know, being to, sealed in to right to, to get to, through to the get border. out of Czechoslovakia to yeah. you know to get to Vienna and then eventually get to Toronto yeah like it's, it's amazing it's amazing what he went through mm -hmm. and and to go through something like that and to to survive it is amazing mm -hmm. but. To then thrive the way that he and did. And be so successful. And, right. You know. And when he got here was, I mean, if that's not inspirational, I don't know what is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, given what his parents went through, they had to have been a huge influence. Absolutely. And, and motivating factor for him. Like if they can do that, 
what can't I do at that mm-hmm. point? You yeah. Know? Yeah, uh, and you look at his son. You could see his his son idolized his father. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know he talks about you know going on the press tour for for the new movie with him, mm-hmm. and how lucky he was to have him. So it's more than just what he put on the screen. Mm-hmm. It's it's what he went through to put things on the screen. Mm-hmm. I think that make him such an amazing and, and individual. such a, a catalog that you know oh, yeah, yeah. will will have you know forever and. Some of the greatest comedies from, you know, the 80s and 90s even, you know, and he was he was a part of it. Yeah. So. And 75. I mean, 75 is too young at this point. Yeah, it really, it really is. is. It's a shame. Yeah. He'll be missed. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about something that's insignificant this week. <laughs> so this Sunday, if you weren't doing anything, it happened to be the Super Bowl. Now, of course, uh, Super Bowl is, is very... Um, uh, regional, I guess you could say, depending on what teams are playing. Regional to North America, maybe. Well, no, but, you know, <laughs> like everybody watches it because everybody wants to to watch the game. It's a good reason to, to have a party. This was probably the first big year, maybe, that people were having get-togethers with the pandemic. Certainly um, the celebrities at the Super the Bowl sub- were. They, they were all partying. Uh, it's a big time to watch the commercials. Uh, you know, it, it happened to be two teams that hadn't won a Super Bowl before, so... That the vast majority of the country were not invested in. Right, so it was kind of like, yay, go whoever. <laughs> um, but one of the interesting things was the halftime show that had a hip-hop heat to it. So old school hip hop showed the kids a thing or two on Sunday night at the Pepsi Super Bowl halftime show. The original gangsters Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre performed with Dr. Dre's mentee Eminem and the queen of R&B hip hop Mary J. Blige and rap star Kendrick Lamar. It marked not only the first time that hip hop artists were the main performers of the halftime show, but also represented Generation X with the opportunity to see if their dance moves were still da bomb or if they were totally bugging to think so. And since the game was played at SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles, naturally Snoop Dogg and Dre kicked it all off with the next episode and got us in a California love mood. Surprise guest 50 Cent then showed up to perform the all-time favorite birthday anthem in the club. I think that's actually pronounced 50 Cent. (laughs) 50 Cent. (laughs) Um, And then it it was time for um, Mary J. Blige to take the stage with her emotional hits, Family Affair and No More Drama. She followed... She was followed by Pulitzer Prize winner Lamar, surrounded by dancers dressed in black wearing Dre Day sashes. The powerful performance appeared reminiscent in style and strength to Beyonce's formation during her halftime performance in 2016. Accompanied by... Uh, a band with Anderson Pack on drums. Eminem was up next with Lose Yourself, which of course caused the crowd to lose it. Eminem ended his song and took a knee, a gesture made famous by former NFL quarterback Colin uh, Kaepernick as an act of protest against poli- pro- sorry, police brutality and racial discrimination. Then it was time to return Dr. Dre, uh, time to return to Dr. Dre, who appeared to be producing the entire performance from a soundboard on top of a set referencing a South L.A. neighborhood. Um, Dr. Dre played a snippet of I Ain't Mad at Cha uh, on the piano, which was a tribute to his former collaborator and West Coast rapper Tupac Shakur, who was gunned down at the age of 25 in 1996. Then he... Uh, then they reminded the audience that he still got love for the streets with some bars from still DRE featuring Snoop Dogg. And that's how you show the young heads that the old heads still got it. So I'll be the first one to admit I, know. I am I am not a consumer of uh, hip hop material. Right. Yep. Um, I I don't get it. 
and and I admit and that. And that's okay. Uh, but I will acknowledge the fact that having all of these superstars of hip hop on stage at once was a monumental achievement. It definitely was. Now, granted, I I will admit it's not my my music of choice. Did I know a good portion of the songs? I did. And that's, it was very entertaining. So as somebody that wasn't, you know, a huge fan, but, you know, somebody that grew up in the 90s, you knew the songs, you know, whether or not, if you had listened to the whole performance, you definitely would have known it. It it was definitely something for the Gen Xers. Uh, It really, really was. And to, to see how much talent, you know, was there it was probably one of the best shows. Last year, it was, um, you know, again, we were in a different time, but the performer was The weekend. I knew one song by the guy, and it was just, it yeah. was just weird, you know? I think when they do the shows where it's a collaboration of multiple artists, it tends to be a better... Right you know, performance, especially when they all go together, because there have been years where they've done multiple artists, but they kind of clash, like right, nobody goes right. together. It's kind of like, well, we're just, we're going to do this person for this group and this person for this group and this per you know, like they kind of, and it doesn't work. This totally worked, you know, and yeah. the fact that as far as I knew, nobody knew that 50 Cent was going to be there. Right. He was a complete surprise. So, of course, when that happened, it was kind of like, ooh, what other surprises are they? Yeah. You know, who else is going to show up? Well, and, and the one nice thing that can be taken away from this is that you've got these superstars, these veteran superstars of hip hop coming out there in a show of unity. Mm-hmm. And you know, they came out you know, tongue in cheek, joking about showing the next generation and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. really, they're out there inspiring the next generation of artists. And, and I think they're that's not huge. just hip hop artists; they're successful actors yep. and producers. Yep. And you know, so it 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 goes to show you, you know, you don't just have to be one thing. Look Absolutely. at everything else you can do, and you can you know come together. Absolutely, very good. That was all we had for our entertainment news this week. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is kind of a funny game showy type show called That's My Jam, um, which uh, is hosted by Jimmy Fallon. And it's actually inspired off of different show segments from The Tonight Show, where he would do the Wheel of Musical Impressions. So basically, they came up with a, hey, let's put together a whole game show with all these different song ideas. So the premise behind the show is they have two uh, teams of two guest celebrities that compete against each other with various musical competitions. So there could be competition... uh, karaoke competition or it could be trivia um or trying to play uh different instruments and getting your your teammate to guess so it's a a fast-paced uh show they uh nbc had tapped him to do there's 10 episodes total uh to to season one not sure if it's gonna get picked up or not uh but he has a, a a live house band it's not the same band that does the tonight show um but still an awesome band and some of the guests are just hysterical and you know it, it's one of those kind of like um you know like oh we're gonna give you this many points and this many points you know and the points don't matter type thing because everything comes down to like the final uh mashup between like what's my line anyway yeah yeah exactly but like the final is a karaoke thing where a, a song gets randomly picked and you have to sing, you know, the lines of the song and then all of a sudden the music's going to go away and you have to continue. And if you get it right, the other team gets squirted with water. If you do it wrong, you get squirted with water. And just watching the 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 uh, celebrities, you know, interact and 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 get all crazy with each other. You know, it, it's it's hysterical. It's it's nice. a nice, you know, you just want something to laugh at. Here's your show. All right. Good pick. Thank you. (laughs) 
So my pick this week is another documentary. This one's on the History Channel, and it's called The Private Lives of the Monarchs. The iconic images of monarchs frequently captured, and I'm not talking about butterflies either. No. Frequently captured in famous portraits and paintings are part of the very fabric of national culture in carefully arranged poses. This is all well and good, but actually they were all just human beings with the same tics and foibles, bad habits and weaknesses as the rest of us. Their collective impact on history fills tens of thousands of textbooks. But what do we really know about these royal figures? The private lives of the monarchs delves beneath the public lives of the monarchs, such as Queen Victoria, King Louis XVI, and Henry VIII, to shine a light on their private lives. By eschewing dates and diplomacy for foibles and fetishes, the show reveals the real-life human beings behind the pomp and pageantry. For, inst for instance, the most, uh, when most people think of Queen Victoria, they think of a woman that's straight-laced and slightly removed from the empire she presides over. But in truth, the queen was a very passionate woman, witty, rebellious, and flirtatious, who defined the Victorian age. Eleven episodes over two seasons, each focus on a specific subject. Season one is a look at historical fix fixtures, such as Queen Victoria, George III, Henry VIII, and Louis XVI. Season two touches on 20th century figures, including Princess Margaret, Edward VIII, uh, and even Hitler and Al Capone. The show itself is interesting. I, I You get me into the, the British show. <laughs> it's all my it, fault. It is. It's all your fault. So I watch oh, look, these honey. things. Oh, look, honey. What's really interesting about this is they get to incredible detail about things that are never released to the public. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, for very good reason, because if if they really got out and were public knowledge, it would really tarnish mm. the image of the royals. Uh, like the episode on, on Margaret, you know, they, they say the public image of, of Princess Margaret was she was this partier, she was this cold, calculating woman and, and you know, was mean to her kids and stuff. And it turns out that she was really this very, you know, fragile but soft mm. and loving person who, you know, she had her issues in in love and she couldn't find someone that that really appreciated her. But she was incredibly gracious and and loving to her kids, and a lot of that never came out because much of what she did do publicly was kind of not embarrassing but controversial and and mm -hmm. kind of uh detrimental to the royals so they didn't release anything that that really they could hold on to that they could they mm. could prevent people from getting out okay uh so things like that they talk about uh queen victoria how she was a very active uh monarch when she was younger and she was you know very flirtatious and and you know she uh, she comes across kind of as the prude of the Victorian age, but she was, I don't want to say loose, but she was much more laid back early on. It wasn't until her husband passes away and she goes into this state of mourning. Yeah, like a dysfunctional state of mourning mm -hmm. where she goes off to, to Scotland and she doesn't even bother with the kingdom for for years and nobody sees her and she only wears black after that. Mm -hmm. She winds up having... Uh, a relationship with the groundskeeper at the at the castle up there, um, and she also winds up having a, a relationship with, I think it was her her Indian chef, mm -hmm. and they were relationships that the family thought and the ministers thought were inappropriate, and when she passed away, all these promises were made to these individuals. Well, the the groundskeeper had passed away. Mm -hmm. And the the chef was really who she turned to next because she didn't have anyone that she could turn to. Right, right. Um, and the, the people that she did turn to were people that her ministers thought were inappropriate mm -hmm. for her because they were below her station. Right. Uh, so it made for a very difficult life for her. So it's stuff like that that you don't read in history books, mm -hmm. you know, that I find very interesting. They, they delve very deeply in these things, but they do it in a respectful way. Mm-hmm. 
um, right up until you you get to one where you're seeing apparatuses that were created for uh, fetishes and stuff like that. And it, it gets a little creepy in some spots, but uh, they're honest, they're open, they're not tabloid, it's not anything like that. So it's mm -hmm. very, it's tastefully done for the most part. Okay. So the private lives of monarchs on the Smithsonian Channel. We'll be right back with our afterthoughts. So what do we have for afterthoughts? So just two quick ones that are, are coming up. Uh, so I'm guessing this is next weekend-ish is the uh, Nerd Fest, which is part of the Jersey Shore comic book show. Nerd Fest! <laughs> there you I really go. can't get into that. Yeah. One. You put push your glasses yeah. or something. <laughs> so this was uh, going to be in Swedesboro, New Jersey, at the Holiday Inn, Swedesboro. Well, I guess we won't um, be going to that one. Why? We got a uh, RP that weekend, don't we? No, we're doing RP. That's not the twentieth weekend. It's the weekend after this weekend. Right. It's not this coming weekend. It's the gotcha. weekend All after. Right. That's you what say I was... next. The sorry, next weekend is sorry. the one that comes up next I'm, in my mind. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, because this weekend's the clarifying the 20th. for all of the audience. Right. So the twenty seventh. So it is just Sunday, the twenty seventh, uh, from ten to four p.m. Admission is five dollars. Kids twelve and under are free with a paying adult. Lots of free parking. Artists, vendors, comics, anime, toys, Funkos, not non-sport car sports, cards, crafts, Pokemon, cosplay, face painting, interactive so stuff. I'm and guessing more. if there's plenty of free parking, this is not a Disney sponsored event. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Just making sure. That was good. And then of course, the I guess probably the week after that is Zoloka. March 5th and 6th in Warminster, Pennsylvania. Uh, Saturday's hours are from 10 to 6, with admission being $15 and children are $5. And on Sunday, it is from 9 to 4 30 with general admission ten dollars kids 12 and under are free all right before we do go i want to once again invite you to subscribe to the podcast you can find this podcast listed as insights in entertainment for audio uh you can find all the network's podcasts listed as insights into things as video uh, we are um actually publishing our audio versions now under our insights into things as well so you can get audio or video trying that out to see how well it does okay we're available on apple Podcasts, spotify pandora castro stitcher podbean buzzsprout amazon music iHeartRadio, stitcher and i think i said them all that were on the screen there. yep <laughs> uh we'd also encourage you to reach out give us your feedback tell us how we're doing give us your shows you'd like us to plug uh you can email us at comments at insights into things.com you can find us on twitter at twitter.com backslash insights underscore things you can find video versions of this podcast on the web at podcast.insights into things.com you can find us on facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast we do stream online six day five days a week i was going I'm going to say six, but that's not true. I got it. <laughs> uh, five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. High res versions of all of our videos can be found on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. And if you missed any of those links, if you go to our main website, you can find links to everything. And that is insights into things. Dot com. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.